have the courage to experiment, have the courage to look at different things and approach pricing different way. The statement that we're going to raise price and our customers are going to leave us and we live in that fear all the time, then, you know, that's not a really rational way of looking at things. Coffee's for closers only. So we've established my proposal to stand in principle. Now we're just haggling over price. <laughs> Let's see how much we're going for an eBay. I mean, it's the same as Dunkin' Donuts. Cost 15 times the price. Today's podcast is sponsored by Jennings Executive Search. I had a great conversation with John Jennings about the skills needed in different pricing roles. He and I think a lot alike. If you're looking for a new pricing role, or if you're trying to hire just the right pricing person, I strongly suggest you reach out to Jennings Executive Search. They specialize in placing pricing people. Say that three times fast. Welcome to Impact Pricing, the podcast where we discuss pricing, value, and the financial relationship between them. I'm Mark Stiving. Today, our guest is Jared Smith. Here are three things you want to know about Jared before we start. He went from being a finance manager at Pepsi to director of pricing at Prime Source Building Products, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. He's currently a business consultant with Vendavo, so he's exposed to pricing a lot. And he's a doctoral student at OSU. Unfortunately, that's Oklahoma State, not Ohio State. Welcome, Jared. Hey, thank you for having me, Mark. Pleasure to be here. Hey, it's going to be fun. How did you get into pricing? And I'm going to assume it has something to do with that transition from finance into pricing. It, it actually did. So my first exposure to pricing really came on the B2C side. So I worked for Frito-Lay uh, right after I got my MBA from another Big 12 school, which is TCU Go Frogs. So I came in there and I managed innovation and the existing business and the P&L there. And I quickly found out I had this knack for working in large data and understanding kind of about the psychology of pricing and, and how that worked. And one of my coworkers said, you know what, you're, you're pretty good with the data. You're pretty good at putting all, all these things together. You should be in pricing. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's just pricing. And so, uh, you know, as time went on, I became part of a team that went to Prime Source Building Products, uh, a B2B place to transform the finance. And specifically, they saw an opportunity for pricing at a B2B business. And three of us went in and tackled it from a few different angles. And I will tell you that that was a painful transition going from B2C to B2B, right? And uh, we put in technology, strategies, implementing a new system. Very challenging in some areas, but over the time we learned, we unraveled everything, and we made a lot of headway. I think along the way that I just found that I loved pricing, I loved the aspect, and I, I always kind of bring it down to that triangle of business acumen, it contains psychology and it contains technology. Those are three things that I really, really like. And from there, I went to work for Vendavo, saw a lot of other companies out there. And then I study that in my PhD and my doctorate right now. Nice. I had no idea we were going to go in this direction, but tell me the difference that you see in pricing for B2C versus B2B. Oh yeah, great. Uh, so in the B2C side, one is you have a lot more access to data, right? You have what's going on in the market out there. You're always, it's a lot more about trade and promotional spend and how you manage that from what, from a net pricing standpoint. When you get it to B&B &B, and someone told me this at one time, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors because it's all negotiated prices. And that's one of the key things. The, the data is very anecdotal at times. So the assumptions that you make, the how you do pricing and the models of pricing, they tend to be a lot more variant than I would say on the B2C side. Um, it, you know, I think that when I looked at what would happen on the B2C side, there was just, it, it seemed a lot more straightforward. You knew what the market was happening. You knew that big players like Walmart or the Kroger's of the world, you knew that what you could give them. When you get to the B2B side, it's just all over the place. And I think that's one of the big things is that the prices are just hidden and how you navigate pricing on there is a little bit, it, it has its own complexities that, uh, that B2C doesn't have. Let me toss out a thought that I have in the difference between the two, and I'd love to hear your comments on this. In the world of B2C, I agree completely that oftentimes it's really data driven because we have so much data. We can see elasticities and, and do experiments. And I mean, there's really a bunch of fun stuff we can do, especially if we're quants. On the B2B side, though, we have the, the need to truly understand the value of our products. Or I would almost argue in B2C, you're selling Frito-Lay or you're selling Fritos, 
you don't really know the value or how somebody values it or you know the way we do in the world of b2b i'm watching well when you buy this how much more money is that going to make you and how do you really value this product uh, so i see them as two very different things from that perspective what do you what do you think yeah i think reconciling that whole value statement between those two uh you know that's a it's an interesting thought and um you know i kind of see it a couple of different ways First of all, on the B2B side, I 100% with the value, I agree with the value statement, trying to figure out what a customer or a segment of customers really value, how you get to that economic value add and, and what it really means, I think is one of the key things that you have to get. And, and honestly, Mark, one of the most difficult things <laughs> overall, right? And uh, I, on your podcast, you have a lot of things in there where pricing is a mystery and pricing is this and value is a mystery. And I 100% agree with it. When you get to the B to C side, I don't, I do believe that value goes in there. I do believe that there is a value equation, but I think it's a much different one. And I think that the reason is, is because you have marketing coming in there, you have brand value, you have things that are going on a little bit more in the psychology of the consumer's mind. Is it value? I think so. You know, you value the brand, you value the dollar per ounce of a chip at any one point in time and what that means. So I do think it comes in there, but I think the, the way that it's approached is just much different. Yeah, and there's always this thing called customer perceived value. It doesn't matter if it's on the B2C side or the B2B side. What I like about B2B is that you already said the words economic value. We can calculate economic value. We have a phrase for that, but there isn't even a phrase for the equivalent of economic value in consumer world, right? How much do I value a shirt? Well, the only thing I know to say is willingness to pay, where that's not true in B2B. I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah, pretty interesting. So assuming that we're going to stick on the B2B side, because of the fact that you had mentioned you're pretty interested in, in sales issues around pricing. Mm -hmm. So I, let's just open it up into a wide open uh, softball question. What do you think are the biggest issues with sales and pricing? And I assume we're talking about B2B. The issue with sales and pricing that I come and then I see a lot of is that sometimes there's a disconnect between the two. It gets very, very siloed. And what I mean by that is that I could be a pricing person and I could, could create all the best pricing things in the world, right? I could put out stuff that I know that is sound mathematically, that brings in the value equation and the perceptions, and then I pass it over to sales. Well, if sales doesn't have a couple of key tools being the value statements, how that goes down, it just all breaks down. And I think that that's one of the key things. I'm a big person on breaking down these silos and making sure that there's a good dialogue, a more what we call an academic, you know, more horizontal dispersion uh, between who's actually doing things between sales, finance and pricing of itself. So I think that's where the, one of the big breaks that breakdowns happen is that do, does your salespeople, first of all, do they understand the true value statements that allows them to defend that price, to go and do that price? And then I would probably say the second one comes around the authority of sales is that, you know, knowing that B2B is one of those things where you're always going to be negotiating, going up and down a little bit. What are the guidelines and what are the rules by which we play with, with salespeople that allows them to deviate from that price? Uh, and, and how does that really lead to profitability? Yeah, so there's a few different things to, to untangle in that conversation. First, how do you think, you had mentioned the triangle that you like to use, and part of that triangle is business acumen. Mm -hmm. Do you think salespeople have the business acumen to be able to say to their buyers, when you buy this product, here's how much economic value you're going to get from, our, from this product? My experience is as the director of pricing and working with a lot of companies is I think there is a shortfall there. Uh, I really, really do. And I think it's kind of one of the weaker areas that, and an area of opportunity for a lot of companies to really put some, put some training, <laughs> really when it comes down to it, to teach people that you can do these value statements, you can do challenger selling, you can do whatever methodology that you really want to do there, but you really kind of have to get down to, we're just, it doesn't, it doesn't need to lead with a price conversation. And that's what happens a lot is the price. And a lot of these, what I would consider blue collar industries, that's what they do. They kind of lead with the price sheet. And that becomes the central part of everything that you're doing without getting into the discovery of what do you really need? What can this thing value? What can we bring to the table? And I see that way more than I like to. 
Yes. And oftentimes when I think about the B2B world, I think we as pricing people don't don't have near the knowledge that salespeople could or should have about how much our customers are willing to pay. Because what I often think is that we we might understand our product really, really well, but we don't understand how much value any one customer is going to get from that product because we don't know their business. On the other hand, one customer knows their business, but they don't really know our product that well. And what it really takes is a conversation between typically it's our salespeople and the customer and the two of them together using business acumen can then figure out how much value could we expect this one customer to get from this one product. And, and that's what I would hope would be driving the pricing. I would hope so too. And again, I think that I see it not as much as I would like to. Again, I think that a lot of salespeople lead with price a little bit too much. And, and instead of having that conversation, what I also see, Mark, is that in a lot of industries where, you know, if you think about customer segmentation, in a lot of these, a lot of these customer segments where you have these sophisticated buyers, I actually find that, that having that type of conversation is a little bit easier. And because they're coming in there, they have a, they're buying a wide swath of products that usually have higher volume. They have a little bit more of that understanding of, of there's a, a little bit more than price. There's service delivery, there's inventory availability, there's, you know, all the things that can come into it. As you start to get into these smaller segments, and if you think about a bell curve, they're the ones with the lower lifetime value at the end of the curve there. They tend to be a lot more price sensitive. So it just goes right into that. And I think that when salespeople have to jump between those segments and understanding what these customers are, that's where a lot of the difficulties come in and you have to evolve your sales force. And that's a whole different conversation of how you actually make that happen. Yeah. L let me slightly switch gears into something sure. else you mentioned earlier, and that is uh, price escalations or sales discount authority levels. Uh, we'll, we'll say both of those fit along. And, and I just wrote a blog or just published a blog not too long ago uh, that Mark Hunter, a guy named the, the Sales Hunter, I, I apologize, Mark, please forgive me. Uh, but he had this statement that he said he doesn't think salespeople should have any discount authority. I read that. I thought that was pretty interesting. But I read that. what do you think best practices are around uh, sales discount authority and escalation processes? Yeah, so... I, I did read that and I was a little taken back by it, to tell you the truth. And uh, when I went back and I do a lot of research in this area and basically it to just kind of give a little bit of background is that the academic community has been following this one back and forth since like 1975. Right. And I really started off with a lot of uh, a lot of the academics saying, hey, you know what, just give salespeople full authority. You know, they just go let them do because they know the market. They know what's happening at the, at the ground level. And then the other camp came in, came in that was a lot more data driven. They said no authority, which is, you know, you just get the price and salesperson, you do that or limited authority, which is where I give you a range. So when I think about the no authority thing, um, and I think about what the data says and the research says, I think that works probably pretty well when you don't have a lot of volatility going at the ground level in the market. If you can keep something stable, then I say, hey, you know what, no, it, don't give any discounts. This is the price. Uh, and you know, hopefully your compensation system is, supports that sort of behavior as well. Uh, but I think B2B, and especially as we've seen in the last two years, doesn't really work like that. And I think that you do need that range there that happens. Now, how you define that range and how you calculate that range, I think is a, is a very interesting, you have to have an interesting approach to that. But the market is volatile. The salespeople know what the, you know, what the, what's going on, on the ground. And I think that customers are, are okay. They will switch if they don't have the value and the price doesn't reflect. So I think you do have to give salespeople a little bit of room to work, a so, little bit of so a let, guideline. Let me clarify this for just a second. I could see the argument that says if we're able to have in the speaker world, we call this fee integrity, right? I set a price and I never change my price. And if you want to hire me, that's the price, period. If we could have fee integrity so we never change prices, then that makes sense. We don't give salespeople any discount authority. But what if we know we're going to negotiate? We know that some customers are going to get a better price than other customers, but we still say we're not going to give sales the authority. They have to come in house and talk to a GM or talk to someone with P&L responsibility before we before we give that discount. Yeah, that's an interesting an interesting statement. So the escalation process there that if we want to deviate from this particular price and go there. 
I would probably, my mind wanders to, is that an efficient way of doing things? You know, is the juice really worth the squeeze to do that? Now, if maybe if you're selling just a couple of different products and I, you know, have X amount, a very small number of transactions per year, that wouldn't create a lot of operational drag to me. You could probably do that. I do believe that giving salespeople autonomy uh, and the, I think the research really says that that's probably one of the better ways to go. Having that escalation process in place, uh, I think is a good thing. But I, to kind of come back on that one, I, I'm not a huge fan of no authority, um, you know, especially if I'm doing a, you know, 5 million transactions a year, <laughs> you know, management, that's all they would be doing is be doing authority. Give a little bit of room and then kind of like set your escalation rules from there is kind of where I land on that. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to defend no authority, although I'm going to try to here for just a sure. moment because it's because sure. it's entertaining. If I give a salesperson no discount authority, um, the salesperson has no choice but to sell value. If I give them any discount authority, they've got this easy lever. Instead of selling value, let me pull this lever first and see if that closes the deal because it's really fast and easy. And if it doesn't, well, now I have to go sell value or I have to escalate it. And so I, what I've seen in companies, and, and tell me if you've seen this or haven't seen this, is if I give salespeople, say, a 5% discount authority, most of my prices and deals end up at a 5% discount. And that's because that's the authority that they were given. And the question becomes that efficiency, which I agree with you completely on, is it worth the 5% we gave up? Yeah, that's a uh, kind of one of those eternal questions, right? You got to go back and forth. And my my response to that would be, first of all, yeah, I do think that obviously would drive a lot of profitable behavior. If I just say no price, I give no authority to discount. And again, you know, salespeople want to discount all the time because they believe that it, it's all wrapped up in prospect theory. There's less risk that I perceive when I do that by giving a discount and I can go get the sale. My retort to that would be, okay, uh, but what about if we set our compensation structures in such a way that motivates them not to discount, to always sell that value, but also maybe even motivate them to go higher than that as well? And, uh, you know, so that would be kind of, you know, my link to this would be that if my compensation structure is just set to, hey, go forth and conquer with one price, sell value, do this. Yeah, I would say that's great. But if my compensation structure is also set to help motivate, go grab that value with a little bit of authority, I find that, you know, maybe taking a little bit more of the psych perception of the salesperson, I think you can, you know, you have higher quality people in there because they have some autonomy. You can probably achieve the same objectives. Nice. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that was the next place I wanted to go. All right. And that, that is, what is a sales compensation plan look like uh, that works for this? And, and now to make life a little bit easier, let's assume that we're going to give a salesperson a 20% discount authority level. What might we do to incentivize this person, the salesperson, to capture as much of, of the profit, as much of the revenue as we can? Yeah, great question. So what I have seen as a practitioner and in the research is that there really is two different main styles of, of compensation, right? You got fixed compensation, you got variable compensation. So those are where it falls. I'm going to focus on the variable compensation portion of it, because that's where all the motivation comes from. And, uh, you know, over time, it really has fall, fallen into three or four different buckets. One of them has been, I compensate you on revenue. Well, I think we know that's not the greatest way to do things, right? It just doesn't motivate salespeople enough to go out there and do things. Uh, a lot of, and I think historically, most B2B businesses do this, is they do it off gross margin. And they say, hey, as your, as your gross margin goes down, then, uh, you know, you don't get paid as much as my gross margin goes up on the deal or the line item, I get paid more. I have a, just a fundamental problem with that because I don't like revealing and focusing on cost, which is a massive part of gross margin. So what I have seen is a lot of companies, uh, I say a lot of companies, a small sect of companies starting to move their compensation structures to focus on price or as a component of it. And what I have found, and we actually enacted that in, in one of the businesses I worked at, and what we found is that there was a lot, of, that was a robust method where we actually saw a lot of results. So if I'm giving, you know, a 20, if I have authority for a 20% discount, maybe after I go 10%, you know, I drop my compensation by 50%, you know, I'm just throwing numbers out there with that. That tends to motivate, uh, you know, salespeople because at that point, I, you know, I start to focus on price. I start to focus on capturing that 
And if I have that good value statement there, then I think that, that that really is a robust method of being able to do that. So seeing that happen in a lot of companies and the data shows that that's actually a pretty robust way of doing it. So I think what you just said is something that I often recommend, but let me just run this by you to make sure. sure. I often recommend that if you're in pricing, you really want to set three different prices, a list price, a floor price, and a target price. Mm -hmm. And then if you have control of a sales comp, uh, anything above target price gets a really high commission rate. Anything below target price gets a really low commission rate. And now we've at least given them incentives to, to hold target price or higher. Yeah, 100%. So those three anchors right there, I think, uh, you know, in the psychology of salespeople, that's what really drives a lot of the behavior and how you put your, your uh, compensation system to move with those three numbers right there. What I do see is that I see a lot of a lot of clustering around the target price, right? That's where they kind of go. They usually at that point you get a you know 100 commission. That's where it's at. So I feel good. I know that's a great price out there. As I start to what I have found challenging is how do you get the price above the target price? How do I motivate salespeople to go toward the list or a ceiling? It kind of is one of those you know a very uh, another term in there, but. I, the, using those three prices, yes, definitely. And I think that's why it's so important to understand what is your target price? What is that value? What is that statement that's happening out there? And how do I teach and motivate my sales force to go out there and, and capture that? Yeah, although I don't think I've ever recommended it. Now that you say that, we could give an even higher commission rate if you hit target, if you hit ceiling. Yeah, yeah, we've right. done that. I, I say we've done that. A plat space, we've done that before to where you were at about a 100% commission rate on target and then you were motivated to go up, you know, an extra 10% and you would receive uh, 115%, you know, overall. And what we did see is that instead of clustering, you know, from the, the target price to maybe 5% below, we actually started to see that bell curve shift up a little bit, which was really, really good for this because when we were, then we started to understand, I think a little bit more of the value that we were trying to estimate mathematically, quantitatively uh, of what was happening. So I, I think it's a really powerful statement to do that. Yeah, and if you think about it, let's assume it's a 10% uh, bump from target to list, that 10% is all profit. One hundred percent. That you probably wouldn't get anyway. That's really kind of a low risk if you think about it, because you're always going to have the target there to go after. Now, Mark, I think the key thing that that I see is when you start to talk about price, it gets into that that whole thing of the you know sales operations. Do I go there and do I lead with that ceiling price and discount down to the target? Well, we still have that whole discounting thing, the concept that's still coming into play. So. At that point, I think it's really incumbent upon the salespeople to go there, to understand the customer, to understand the strategy of what I'm going to go in there. That way, I don't give this, you know, the, the, the whole view that I'm just discounting from whatever point I'm doing, um, but to come in there and lead with a price that you think is going to be the real willingness to pay for. Right. And so we're back to understanding the value that a customer is going to get from our product. Yeah, 100%. It always comes back to that. Jared, this has just been fabulous. We are out of time, though. Final question. Sure. What's one piece of pricing advice you would give our listeners that you think could have a big impact on their business? I believe, Mark, that one piece of advice that I would give is to have courage. And pricing is one of those things that it's complex. It gets real complex really, really fast. People can be scared to raise price. You know, for instance, my advice be to have courage, have the courage to experiment, have the courage to look at different things and approach pricing different way. The, the statement that we're going to raise price and our customers are going to leave us and if we live in that fear all the time, then they, you know, that's not a really rational way of looking at things. Also have courage to develop the capability of pricing in your company. Invest in good people, invest in good technologies, things that can support this as a discipline, much like you've been doing in supply chain and all these other ones for years. So have courage to change, have courage to have the critical conversations. Nice. Love that. And the other place I would add courage is when a procurement guy comes and says, you got to lower your price 30%, have the courage to say no. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, exactly. just say no. <laughs> so nice, nice. Jared, thank you so much for your time today. If anybody wants to contact you, how can they do that? Uh, please contact me through LinkedIn. Uh, you'll find me on there, Jared Smith, and I'll be pretty easy to, to recognize. I'm the one that came from OSU and TCU in the Big 12. So, All right. We'll have uh, his LinkedIn link in our show notes as well. Episode 135 is all done. Uh, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, would you please leave us a rating and a review? 
And finally, if you have any questions or comments about the podcast or pricing in general, feel free to email me, mark at impactpricing.com. Now, go make an impact. Thanks again to Jennings Executive Search for sponsoring our podcast. If you're looking to hire someone in pricing, I suggest you contact someone who knows pricing people. Contact Jennings Executive Search.